Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. Now uh, this week's video is about one of the most iconic cameras ever built, built by Kodak and that's the uh, Kodak Vest Pocket Camera. It was introduced in uh, uh, 1912 and at the same time it came out with this uh, film that Kodak invented, the 127 roll film. Uh, this film uh, was very popular but it was discontinued in the mid 1990s but you can still buy there are people that make 127 roll film and if you can't buy it ready made you can re-spool or cut 120 roll film and re-spool it onto the 127 spools so you can still use virtually any any modern film now the the original uh, vest pocket camera didn't have this function where you could write using a pen a pen supplied with the camera and you would open that on the autograph model this was fetched out in uh, 1915 and you could write in that gap there you know any details that you wanted to do location dates names etc uh, I don't think you can do that with modern films uh, because the film at that time had the film then I think it had a sheet of uh, some sort of tissue paper then the uh, backing paper and uh, once you'd wrote on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the backing paper you would hold it up to the light for a few seconds and that would imprint data onto the film but as I say I don't think you can do that with the modern films the original 1912 uh, version didn't have the, this function to uh, be able to write on the backing paper as I say this was fe fetched out uh, just after the start of the First World War and Kodak were uh, very clever with their marketing. They could see uh, a potential, some uh, potential big sales, telling soldiers to take the vest pocket and document their war, so to speak, uh, which they did. And we have lots of pictures nowadays, thousands of pictures taken in the First World War, taken with these, with these cameras. Although the um, authorities at the time, in the US and the British Army, etc., uh, didn't like all these pictures going back home showing some of, the, some of the horrors of the First World War and they tried to stop these soldiers from using the cameras and taking pictures but there were still many pictures uh, did get out there and we can see these pictures today. The camera is uh, very simple and, and, and very uh, well built. It, it's built of uh, aluminium and um, the, the shutter mechanism, the, the way you open the camera is very, very simple and I think that's why a lot of these cameras still exist today. There were many variations of this camera from 1912 up to about 1935. Uh, different lens uh, combinations, uh, better lenses. This camera has a, a single element meniscus lens. So if, you, if you're going out with, it, with this camera, these types with a the, with the single element lens, don't expect super sharp pictures. They're there to take record shots, but you do get that uh, timeless look to the images. Uh, some of the cameras were what they call the special cameras. They had a, a finish on it, like a, a cracular finish, and uh, some, of the, some of the specials had the, the bodies covered in leather. So there was a lot of versions of this camera. I think uh, the version of this camera, uh, during, the, during its uh, production, I think they sold one and three quarter million of them, so it was very, very popular. And that, as I say, that's why there's a lot of these cameras still about and working today. Now this camera has uh, the uh, ball bearing shutter, patented by a Kodak. The shutter speeds run from a 1 a 25th of a second and the fastest being 1 50th and then you have the B and the time mode. Now Kodak say that uh, if you're using this camera for longer exposure in time mode you have to stand the camera on something solid like that because there's no tripod socket and then put your hand over the lens, open the shutter in the time mode, move your hand away, take the picture uh, take the picture after the uh, exposure time, put your hand over the top and close the shutter and that's how we you do longer exposures. The camera has a, a viewfinder at the top there, mirrored viewfinder and if you use it in the portrait format you would look down into that and compose your picture. Uh, if you wanted to use it in landscape the actual uh, viewfinder turns like that so you would then hold the camera up and look down that way. The shutter button on this camera is just a very simple lever which is there and you just press that down. 
So a very, very simple uh, camera to operate. There's four apertures on this camera. And as you, as you can see at the front, uh, on this particular model, as I say, they're all, all uh, uh, different. This one has got names on it for lighting conditions. And, it's, and it goes one, two, three and four for different lighting conditions. But it doesn't tell you the aperture. Well, from a bit of research and pictures I've taken, I think the apertures are number one would be uh, uh, f11, two f16, three f22 and four f32. So when I use this camera, I try to uh, get the lens well stopped down. That's where I'll get the better quality pictures. The camera is uh, top loading. So you, there's a little lever there, you pull that down and you pull the top of the camera off and you load the film into those two holes by pushing the film down at the back there. I'll show you that later on, how, how you load the film. And then you simply to uh, put the top on, you just push it on like that and then there's a little knob there and just push that and it locks into place. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's working great. You've got a red window at the back which tells you your frame numbers. Now when I go out of this camera I, uh, I tend to cover that with some black tape and only reveal it when I'm winding on to the next frame and recover it. I don't want light getting because I think it would get in because it's quite a, a big red window and it's quite bright. So uh, I always cover that up. So in this video I'm going to show you what I had to do with this camera uh, to get it working again. Because they're a simple, simple camera they're quite easily to, uh, easy to get going again. And, and I'll, for those that don't know, I'll show you what I did to get this camera working. And then I'm, I'm going to go out with the camera and take some pictures. And I'll show you the pictures that this camera can do. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's going to be fun using it. And uh, I'm going to load it with some uh, film that I've bought, ready-made film. Uh, it's called HP 400. I think it's uh, made by Ilford, but it's, it's rebranded. Re uh, but it's uh, a 400 ISO film. Uh, virtually the same as Ilford HB5. So let me show you what I did with the camera to get it to get it working again, and then I'll show you the actual pictures I took with this camera. Right, in this uh, part of the video, I'm going to show you how I got this uh, camera working, and I can virtually guarantee if you buy cameras from these on the auction sites or at uh, camera fairs, etc., unless they've been professionally serviced, you can guarantee that there's always something you need to do to get them working. They'll be advertised, often I see it on eBay, where the camera says, um, everything's working properly, not film tested. <laughs> I don't know how they get that, but I can guarantee that uh, uh, there's always something to do with them. So in this part of the video, I'm going to show you what I did uh, to get this camera working. Now, some of you might know, but for those that are thinking of buying one of these cameras, I just thought it'd be helpful to show what, what you have to do to get them working correctly. Now, I'll just zoom in a little bit. Oh no, first of all, I'll show you the difference in size. This is a Agfa Billy Clack number 74 uh, struck camera. And if you, as you can see, if I press that button, the camera opens like that. In much the same way, although it's automatic on the clack, it's a strut camera. But look at the size, uh, actual size difference in these cameras. This is a, whoops, <laughs> is that clever? That's a, a 120 roll film camera and takes 6x9 negatives and this is a 127 a camera and uh, it takes smaller negatives so the camera's smaller and that's by, why uh, Kodak probably came out with the 127 film to make a camera that, uh, as its name implies, uh, pocketable. So that's their size, size difference. Right, put that away and let, uh, let me show you what... Uh, to look for on these cameras now to get them going again. So I'll just zoom in a little bit. Now the first thing you need to be checking is the uh, the shutter and see and uh, shutter speeds and the iris. See if it's stopping down okay. So I'll open the camera and uh, just test the shutter. Now I'm on one fiftieth now and press it and just see if the shutter opens and closes. Do it a few times just to make sure it's not sticking. That seems to be fine. The next one is time. That's where if I press it down once, it stays open. Press it again and it closes. And then the next one is B. That's where I press it down, keep it down, 
let go and it closes. So that's working. And then this is 1 25th of a second. I've actually timed these with an app on my iPhone and they're well, working well within the bounds uh, for black and white film, so there'll be no problem there. The other thing to check is the iris to see if it's stopping down. So if I move the lever, close the camera, you can see that the iris is opening and closing. So all that seems to be working fine. So I've had nothing uh, to do with this camera. Now you notice with this camera, there's no glass element. Some of the uh, vest pocket cameras did have those, it depended on the model, but this one doesn't. And a lot of people sometimes think the glass has fallen out. But the lens element, the single men meniscus lens, is at the back of the shutter and you can't see it. So uh, if you see these, it hasn't lost the glass, it's behind the shutter. But we need to check to see if that lens is, is clean. Um, and it's a very difficult camera to get into and I'll show you why. So now we've established that's all working, we need to then check the bellows. Now I've inspected these bellows by eye and they seem fine, but I need to do a, a, a better test. I need to get some light into those bellows in a darkened room and then look all around it and that will show any light leaks. And the only way that you can get into this camera uh, to get to the rear element of the bellows is by removing this plate here. Now I've slackened this one off. And this is a difficult part of these cameras. It can be very, very tight to get off. Uh, you can use one of the rubber um, uh, element uh, removers, one of those that you, you know, press down like that and turn it. Uh, you can try one of those. But I had to resort to using my lens wrench. And I've actually scratched it doing that. I'll have to touch it up. By just adjusting that whoops, uh, to the size of the circumference of the plate and then really forced it and turning it and I did get it to move uh, but I had to do that to get inside uh, I haven't damaged it I've just scratched the paint off and I can uh, or I will see really touch that back in but once once you've got it loose you can take that plate off even now it's difficult to move there we go it's off and it's just just that plate that's all it is but that is the hardest part is getting this this off uh, it reveals the lens. Now on my camera the lens was absolutely filthy. So to get to the lens, obviously you keep it uh, shut. Again you use a lens wrench and you've got to do this very very carefully so you don't scratch the, uh, the actual element itself. I'm not going to take it out because I've cleaned it but you get the lens wrench in and there's two little holes, recessed holes at the side of the lens element and you just turn it uh, anti-clockwise and screw it out. And I did this with mine and uh, uh, as I say the lens was filthy and it's, it's really clean, I've got it really clean. It's just a single element lens. So that's how to uh, uh, get to the lens and clean it. And then to test the bellows, uh, then with that off, I pull the bellows fully out like that. And then in a darkened room I get a very bright torch like this and I shined it into the back like this and had a look all around the bellows. Now remember I said I didn't see any light leaks, just visual, uh, any splits in the bellows, just visually looking at it. By using the torch I found that there was um, an area on the bellows and it was just around about there where some of the stitching come loose. So what I did was, because I can get into the bellows, I don't know if you can see inside there now, probably not, yeah you can just see them, can you see the tape that I put on? Is it the other side? Yes, there. You can just see I put some tape on there, and the bellows were split just in that area here. Uh, so I managed to get some tape on, put the torch back in, and the uh, the uh, bellows are now light tight. So that's good. The other thing that I did was the only way that you're going to get uh, a view with this camera uh, is by looking through this uh, uh, glass prism. Now this is easy to clean. Uh, you simply undo that screw there again you might need some cloth or something on it but it does undo if they're a little bit dicey sometimes just spray, spray carefully a little bit of WD-40 and it just pulls off and you can see there there's a little spring plate took, took that off just force that up it does come off there we are that came off there 
and then to get to the actual mirror itself I got a very fine screwdriver there's two little there's a little indent there you can just see that little indent and there's one on the other side and that drops into two little uh, holes uh, on the holder for the mirror just gently force that off and it reveals the mirror and I cleaned it with isopropylene uh, and uh, some uh, lens cleaner and just cleaned it all up and then you simply put the the washer back on there it goes behind a little plastic uh, latch there push it back on and then just screw the uh, screw that back on once you've got that on tight the whole thing starts to work in as it should do it should go like that and then like that and basically that's all I had to do uh, put a little bit of oil on some of the joints etc and then the next thing and the final thing was the uh, top plate on the camera now some of you might do this some might not but I have done that if you look at the uh, top plate make sure that it's not bending arcing upwards that way look at it straight on like this and if you can just bend it very very slightly so it's got a board so it's bored slightly and it means that when it goes on to there once you put the film in the press the catch it really tightens it down uh, at left and right hand side uh, so you get a good seal now I've also on this camera um, I don't know if you can see that I have some ready cut light seals in different widths and I put a light seal all the way around all the way around the this uh, plate and that will then the foam will seal on all those edges all the way around to ensure that I'm not going to get any light in you know these cameras when they were brand new probably were uh, you know perfect but over years uh, things do move and get twisted and uh, you know uh, sometimes you have to do things like that because uh, light can be one of your worst enemies and, and spoil your pictures so basically that's um, you have know, to make sure that legs in when you close it basically how I got the camera going and then once you've done all that you simply bob that on get it into position and um, and tighten it up the other thing that I did with this camera uh, this is where you wrote on the backing paper with this little pen you would write in that area onto the backing paper well it's not something that I'm going to do and I don't think it'll work with modern film so I blanked that area off with some uh, thin mylar again just to ensure that no light is going to get in anywhere around that area uh, the, the, uh, you know the older films weren't as sensitive as, as modern films uh, so you've got to really make sure that they are light tight uh, as I say otherwise that will spoil your pictures so basically that's how I got this uh, beautiful camera working again easy to do uh, nothing nothing technical about it oh one other thing uh, always check all these little screws there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten on this model all these were loose so I just tightened them up didn't over tighten them just make, make, make sure they were uh, decently tightened uh, so they wouldn't uh, fall off and that makes sure that everything's working uh, true to uh, the engineering of, of, of when it was made I'll show you how to uh, load the camera then we'll show you the pictures so first of all you've got to undo that latch push it um, if you look at the camera you push it to the uh, left hand side and then take the top plate off and then you'll have two spools now you, you have to make sure that the slotted part of the, of the, of the, of the take up spool is facing upwards like that because that connects into the slotted part of the actual uh, wind winding mechanism there so make sure that the slotted part is facing upwards and then you just get the film I'm going to struggle with this one I always do show you how to load films on on videos push it into the slot on the take up spool like that and then this is just a backing paper there's no film in it it's what I've just used to test test with um, pull it across like that so it's well well onto that spool there and then pull the 
the take up spool until the film's tight, the backing paper is tight and you've got to get it in that slot at the back. Now this can be a little bit tricky until you get used to it. And once it's in, push it all the way down and it's locked into position. Then make sure if you can, uh, make sure that, that that slot there is lined up with that slot. Something like anyway. And then place it onto the top. Just make sure that that is lined up with that one. You'll know anyway because the film won't wind on if it's not connected. Then push the latch fully to the right hand side. And then just turn the film until number one comes up. So we keep turning. Now come that's one set of arrows, dots, dots, and then we're at number one. And then what I do is uh, once I've wound on in in the shaded light, I always cover that up with black tape because I think that will uh, get light in it. It'll probably hit the backing paper, bounce to the sides, and uh, it will it will fog the film. So make sure you tape that over. So that's how to load the camera. It's easy. And when at the end of uh, the last shot, you just keep winding and winding until the backing paper doesn't show to that window. And then lift the top up and pull that spool out and you're ready to develop the film. So that's it. So right, finally, let's look at the pictures. Right, I'm finally out with the Kodak vest pocket camera, although it's in a coat pocket, but it's so tiny it'll even fit into my trousers pocket there. Lovely little camera. I've loaded the camera with the uh, HP 400 127 black and white film, and I've fetched a, another roll just in case I want to take some more pictures. Uh, I'm not going to show you or record every time I take a picture because I think it's going to be a bit repetitive, but I'll just show you how I'm going to work with this camera. And then uh, after I've uh, shown you this part of the video, I'll show you the pictures as they turn out. Uh, the first thing, obviously, you have to pull the bellows out. But one of the mistakes people make with these cameras is they pull the bellows out like that and they think they're fully extended. They're not. And if you, if you do it like that, you, you are going to get really out of focus pictures. You have to give them a nice tug and make sure that they are fully extended. And that way, the focus is in the set with this camera. So uh, just remember to do that. I'm going to use it in the portrait format, that's where I'm looking down this glass a mirrored viewfinder and then if I want to do it in landscape format I just turn the viewer that way and then look down that way. Um, the light meter I'm going to use, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to use my Seaconic light meter in the incident light reading mode, that's where I'm measuring light falling onto the subject, the light goes and gets mixed up in that dome and gives me a, 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 usually a good reading. Uh, and I'm going to try and keep this camera at 1 50th of a second. As I said uh, previously in the video, it has two shutter speeds, 1 25th and 1 50th. Now 1 25th is quite slow and you need a, a steady hand, which I haven't got. So I'm going to try and keep it around to 1 50th. Uh, just take a light read, meter reading now and it's uh, it's 60th of a second at f22 so that means i can get the lens well stopped down to f22 i can't use 60th i'll have to use 50th but that'll be absolutely fine so i'm going to walk around here uh, i've got an idea for one or two shots and then i'm going to move on down into otley town center and just document some pictures there uh, this is what this camera was really designed for so we'll have a, a look around here uh, see what there is and as I say I'm not going to record every time I take a picture it's difficult with this camera in any, in any case because you need two hands to operate it and I didn't want to affect a tripod to mount the GoPro so we'll have a little look around and see what we can see here and then hopefully I'll show you all the pictures that I've taken this is a lovely old church here it's in the Washburn Valley and this was the idea of the photograph but I'm not too sure now, I'll just have to have a, a little look through the viewfinder of the, the old camera looking down that way into that mirrored viewfinder 
and uh, see what the composition looks like. Then as I say I'll move down to Otley. It's absolutely beautiful around here. It's what we call the Washburn Valley. Beautiful area. So peaceful. Love it. I'm not antisocial but I do like it when people are not about when I'm doing videos etc. <laughs> right we'll move on and uh, see what I can find. Right, I hope you enjoyed those pictures uh, taken with this beautiful Vest Pocket Autographic Kodak camera. Uh, this camera takes, as I say, 127 roll film, again invented by Kodak, and uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, using it. It's a beautiful little camera, and there's uh, a few reasons why I, I love these old uh, vintage cameras, especially the ones that are over 100 years old. Uh, usually the build quality is very simple on them, there's no electronics, so when you buy these cameras, they're quite easy to uh, take apart and get them going again. I've got this going, there were certain things that weren't right with it, but, but just with a little bit of lubrication and a bit of tender loving care, you can get them working again. So that's a good advantage of the old cameras, and I think that's why there's still a lot of these old vintage cameras that survive today. The other thing is um, to do with the lens itself. On this uh, camera, it's a simple... Uh, meniscus single element lens a lot of the really old cameras had simple lenses and um, because they are a simple design they're easy to clean you haven't got these multiple groups of elements like the model lens and uh, it's the way they, they produce the, the, the look the, 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 the tone on the negative I just absolutely love it when I compare the pictures from some of these old cameras to the more modern optics that I have and especially some of the uh, digital optics where they're so corrected and multi-coated. I think some of the, the character uh, has gone out of those pictures. Uh, you know, we're, we're striving for this perfection and uh, these cameras don't give it. This camera doesn't produce sharp images like a, a lens of today. It produces images that are not that sharp, but when printed out at a, a correct viewing distance, they look absolutely fine. 
But I think we've got to look beyond, to use this camera, you, you've got to look beyond perfection and you've got to look at um, the imperfection. I think the Japanese called it wabi-sabi. Rather than strive in perfection, look for the beauty of imperfection. And if you can get your head around that, you'll, in, you'll, you'll really enjoy using these type of cameras. The other thing that I like about these cameras is the history that's attached to them. Now, I don't know, this camera uh, could have been uh, uh, taken by a soldier to France during the First World War. He could have taken, taken pictures uh, where he was doc documenting his war. Uh, maybe not, but uh, there is a chance that it, it, it was taken there. And that just inspires me to go out and, and take pictures with these cameras because of that history. And, and I'm, I'm sampling uh, the early photography, the way that they used to use these cameras. So, you know, I get a real buzz out of using these old cameras. And especially when you've, uh, you've, you've, you've got bought one of these and cleaned it up, gone out, taken the pictures and you come back you develop the negative and you see that you've got some nice pictures on those negatives. It really uh, inspires you to go out and take more and sometimes, uh, like me, to buy more of these vintage cameras uh, and sample uh, what it was like and, and, and what it was like to produce these old negatives. So for me, that they are a, a great fun and it just keeps my interest going in, in, in photography. Uh, the, the thing is, photography, uh, when we look at, say digital cameras are they going to have the history that these cameras have i suppose they will have in some way but uh, the ability to be able to go buy film and put it into a camera that's over 100 years old and still produce images it just to me it's it's an absolute pleasure to to, to use these cameras and, and to be able to to do that so i would say if not if you've never used old vintage cameras if you use shoot film but never used old vintage cameras Go buy one that they're cheap to buy. Have a little bit of fun getting them working. Go out and them using, and and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it. And if you like me, you will be smitten, and you'll start buying more. Now, regarding this camera, uh, there was a few things with it. First thing, and I mentioned this in the video, when you pull the bellows out on this camera, it locks in a certain position. Now, if you take a picture like that, you're going to get a blurred image. I found the best way is to put your finger and your thumb on those struts, and then just push it out like that and push it down these uh these struts they've got a little um bearing at the at the end and it slips down into this part on the front strut and that holds it in position so always make sure that they're fully fully extended i did take one picture uh in otley of some people walking over the bridge and you can see where i didn't get the bellows extended i've ended up with a blurred picture so make sure they're fully out and you will get uh, correct focus the other thing with the camera was the actual prism the glass uh, prism finder there uh, you know you look down that it's much like looking in a waste level finder I found it sometimes difficult to uh, see through this uh, just depending on where the light was hitting it uh, sometimes it was easy and other times it wasn't but uh, I did get used to it but when I when I did struggle I simply pointed the camera at the, uh, the subject I was photographing and just guesstimated the uh, composition and they turned out fine so there is a workaround for that. Now there are people out there that might say that uh, why did I, I use a light meter using an old camera like that if I want to sample early photography. Well the camera does have two shutter speeds 1 25th and 1 50th and it has four apertures and you can set intermediate apertures on this you're not just stuck with f11 and f16 you can uh, you can set the aperture between f11 and f16 etc. So the more you use that, I think the more you get used to it. But I used the light meter because I wasn't sure, because the apertures are not marked. I calculated them to be f11, f16, f22 and f32. But I needed to use a light meter just to check that I was getting the correct exposures. Now after, after seeing the negatives, I think those apertures are correct. And uh, the next time I go out with the camera, I'll probably not use a light meter and I'll just use it as it was intended many years ago by just pulling the camera out, uh, checking the light, setting the exposure and taking the picture and hopefully the film's built-in latitude to under and overexposure will, uh, will help you out. Uh, that's why I use the light meter. So all in all, I absolutely loved using the camera. I love using all the old cameras that I have 
and uh, I did like the results. Some people might not because, as I say, they're not as sharp. Uh, this this lens on this camera it isn't as sharp, nowhere near as sharp as the one in the previous video of the TED. But uh, you have to accept what you get with these cameras. And uh, as I say, look for the, the the beauty in the imperfection of these cameras. Don't look for perfection, or you'll never be happy. You know, it's quite amazing, really, that uh, cameras like this, you know, they're over 100 years old, are still capable of taking really nice pictures. And, you know, it got me thinking about photography in general. Regardless of what uh, camera you use, whether it be a, a digital camera, where it has a digital sensor, or a, a film camera like this, uh, the main ingredient uh, for all those cameras uh, is light and time. And in that split second that you take the picture, that determines how your picture is going to look. So we have the advantage using film because we've got this long history and we can go so, va so far back in time that we can use cameras like this with the optics, the simple optics that these cameras had and produce images that are different and uh, to me have more character. I think from the um, 50s as uh, technology in, in optics uh, got better that the the lenses tend tend to uh, lose that, that 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 feel and that look uh, that these old uh, these old optics can uh, give or produce. So if you've never sort of used these old classic cameras, I would strongly recommend if you use film, just try them because you are sampling uh, uh, an early way of of taking pictures, not on the the old films, obviously. But the actual process of using them is just the same. And it is great fun. So, you know, if, if you get the chance uh, and see one of these old cameras, don't have to be one of these, uh, but one of the old cameras, try them and, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. And if you can get your head around the uh, Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi, then you will, you will really enjoy, I'm sure, using these classic old cameras. So that is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, a like, uh, subscribe to my channel. And uh, if you have any questions, leave them below and I'll get back to you. And uh, as I always say, stay safe and I'll see you all in the next video. Best Pocket Kodak.